just want to make a comment about um, the, the flute, because I, I was just so intrigued by this, because I work, as you will learn, uh, most of my work, and I'm drawing uh, my examples mostly from uh, Central Asia into Mongolia. Uh, uh, we can consider Mongolia part of Central Asia, but just an inner Asia, we would say. Uh, and I work especially with Kazakh uh, people, and they play a musical instrument called Sauz. And in, of course, in, in the Mongol and Tuvan people, uh, Tsur and Chur are the names of the instruments. And, and what is so interesting is that uh, they, the, uh, the, the people that I work with, the, the flute maker, I mean, the, the person who plays the flute makes his, his own flute um, and splits it in half, of course, uh, and uh, doesn't burn it, uh, but, but carves it out, uh, uses a goat throat, um, glues it back together with animal glue, uses a goat, goat, float to, goat throat <laughs> to bind it together, and then wraps it with gut or string. And so there's this really interesting method, and it's, it's also an end-blown flute, not a side-blown flute that we're so used to in Europe. Um, and so there's some really always very interesting um, relationships that, that allow us as ethnomusicologists to begin to talk, um, not dangerously comparatively, but just in, in interestingly, interesting ways, you know, in terms of methodologies. Um, and, and behind that, I think, does it, the wood, <laughs> wood and relationships with wood and spiritual relationships with wood, um, and, and, but, but also, at the same time, very practical relationships with wood, I think, are very important. I, I tend uh, to work on a practical level um, with materials, and I think it's partly because I, I work um, both as an ethnomusicologist, but I am really, really concerned about the environment. <laughs> and I'm really concerned about ecology and what is happening to musical instruments. And, and so that pulls me in to, to, you know, to several different worlds, but there's this really, really practical element. And so I'm going to uh, spend some time uh, talking a bit about a, uh, a subject that I, I hope you will find interesting. So uh, I, I've, I've visited uh, instrument makers in many, many locations in different parts. I don't want to say around the world because I've not been everywhere, but I've been in a lot of places. And it, partly because I've been so curious about musical instruments for many, many years, and also partly because I worked for a museum uh, for uh, almost four years. And so I had an opportunity. I was the wheeler and dealer and the film, I, you know, I did the filming and I did the, 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 the buying and, and the, I, I gathered the stories and, and, uh, and had the most amazing opportunities uh, with people, uh, with the people who make uh, and play, but especially the people that make uh, musical instruments. And I went to workshops. Um, I went to factories, <laughs> musical instrument factories, and I met people uh, in spaces, in little spaces, uh, in, in a, that are carved out of, of a room. And so some of the, some of the kinds of spaces uh, that, uh, that I, I visited and places, uh, as, as I've already revealed, uh, a lot of it is focused especially in from China to Mongolia into uh, Central Asia. And, uh, and uh, some of them very rural uh, and, uh, and very rugged. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, but but these are, these, this is really what I experienced uh, as, as I was traveling from Turkey uh, to Taiwan, from the Philippines, this is the Philippines, uh, to India, from Mongolia, uh, to Uzbekistan, and this, of course, is Western China. I, I'm not a woodwork worker, uh, and, and so the workshops I visit appear at first glance to be somewhat in, in disarray. They're logs just strewn around, in yards, under workbenches. Lumber is piled in corners, sometimes in bro broken pieces of furniture, like tool handles. Um, it's stuck in uh, among the, the, uh, the, the lumber. Um, <clears throat> you, you find uh, half-carved instruments um, or instrument parts uh, in boxes or, um, or on the floor in piles. And I don't have an answer for the Shanghai, those are pipa, and why I think they all, all had blemishes of some kind. Um, I I instruments strewn on shelves or up in rafters. 
Um, and, and resonators, and this is another uh, strewn on shelves, and some of you know the answer to this. This is drying, of course. Um, and, and in one place, um, I found uh, resonators lying in a muddy stream. And they were not, as some of you know, were, were not being discarded. They were being processed. <laughs> Um, and so you, there are things you need to understand about what's going on. And, and of course, we know that these, these, uh, it isn't uh, chaos. It's, it's, there's, there's great order in, in a kind of disorder. I, I find that war, uh, workbenches tell great stories about makers and building processes. There's tools, oh, there are tools and glue, templates, paper, pencils strewn around, sometimes an empty vodka bottle tipped over. Some makers are very well organized. Instrument parts, as in this case in Uzbekistan, may line walls. Tools may be hung neatly in their places. I've seen some workshops like this, as you can see here. Yet I would argue that even in these environments, there's a kind of disorder. That because working with wood, um, it, in the process of working with wood, um, there, there's a certain kind of flexibility that's mixed with creativity and, and sp spontaneity uh, that, cre that, that creates a need to adapt, to be working with adaptation all the time, and to be using creative um, adaption, ad adaptive um, skills, really, uh, in order to make these, this wood sing, <laughs> in order to make a musical instrument sing. So the values, and I'm telling, some of you know these things, and I'm going to go through just a few things, and I do kind of have an argument uh, that I hope, hopefully I will get all the way through this. Um, <clears throat> the, the, when makers are selecting wood for musical instruments, uh, and, and I, I just love the way, you know, what we talked about kind of coordinates in an interesting way. So uh, the, the instrument makers that, that, not only the instrument makers that I work with, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of jump into the European world a little bit too, because I'm gonna talk comparatively. Um, but they, they're, they're con th those instrument makers that are committed to using natural resources, they judge wood uh, by its stability, its density, and structure. We know that. They're really, really concerned about its acoustical potential. But they are also really interested in the visual attributes of wood. Uh, and they want it to look beautiful, the aesthetic uh, co component that has to do with the, the visual is really critical. So this, this stability and density and structure um, are concerns uh, in relation to the rims and beaters for percussion or the bodies of, of wind instruments, such as a clarinet or a bassoon, the soundboards for resonators, tun tuning pegs or necks uh, for strings, uh, the acoustical characteristics of wood, um, how well will it resonate when it's part of a musical instrument. It's really interesting to watch luthiers listen to wood. I don't know if any of you have had that experience. But I've, I've had that experience uh, certainly in, in some of the uh, workshops that I've, I've been in in actual Asia, where uh, taking uh, the, these, or either the, the uh, resonator, I mean the uh, spines or, or ribs of the resonator, or more importantly, the soundboard, the flat piece in the front, like the, the front of a guitar. Um, and uh, generally these are pieced together. Uh, because the wood isn't big enough anymore uh, for, the, for them to create these with a single piece of wood. And they, they take the, the, uh, the wood that they will use for the resonator all from the same log. And uh, then they will very, very carefully uh, plane it down. And then they'll, they'll listen. And they'll listen. And they'll listen to the sound of that wood. And they'll listen to the sound of the wood for the balance uh, they, they, they're among all of the pieces. They want to make sure that it has a, a sound quality, that, they, that it goes together well. And I've talked to people, I was in Kazakhstan once and, and was speaking with a very highly regarded maker, and he said if they don't sing together, he throws them all out. It's a total loss. Uh, and so it's, it's really, really important. 
the, the um, visual attributes of, of woods, uh, researchers argue the visual at attributes are more important than acoustic. And, that, and in many cases, that's true. And, and one of the arguments is that, uh, you know, so, somebody uh, will, um, will choose, you know, a piece of wood uh, because of its beauty. Um, over the, the sound, and you can find that you know, in Europe, among European makers, as well as makers in other parts of the world. Makers with a world of wood to draw from rely on old values when they're selecting their materials. They, they're tied to traditional systems that are passed down for generations. Uh, so a, a couple of examples uh, from the European world. Uh, wood identified uh, as valuable for its density and structure is African blackwood. And of course, African blackwood is not grown in Europe. It's grown in Africa, and then we can begin to talk politically, but we won't right now. Um, so African blackwood is a gnarly tree. Uh, it's coveted uh, for, by, by uh, oboe, bassoon, and clarinet makers, for example. But I would note also that it's used in Tanzania, where it's, it's largely the place that it's grown, for uh, uh, crafts, local crafts, but also local medicine. And one of the things that I find is like, as I travel and look at all of these, these woods that are being appropriated, let's say, um, very often the woods uh, ha are connected to traditional medicine as well. And, and there's a loss, uh, a, a factor in, in relation to loss that's important to, to remember anyway. But, but the big piece, the big, big wood, <laughs> really, in European uh, um, instrument making is spruce, as many of you know. Uh, Norway spruce, Sitka spruce, th those are the woods <laughs> um, for sound boards of violins, of guitars, of pianos. And there's this resonant quality uh, to spruce that, is, that I would argue has been cultivated and it's, been cultivate, it's become a cultivated a pres a preference in sound so that makers seek it out. It's a cycle <laughs> in a way. And so even people will seek it out. And I've documented this. People are documenting this. People will seek it out even though industries are stripping the lands where they're grown, leaving nothing for, the, for regeneration. And that's what's happening uh, in Alaska with Sitka spruce. Uh, and, but still, it, no matter how many times you, you, know, you look to see what European instruments are made of, violins, uh, uh, stringed instruments, violins, guitars, spruce, Sitka, Norway spruce, those are the really key sounds. And so you think, well, that must be the most beautiful sound, <laughs> the source of sound. But the fact is that when you go to other parts of the world, and my, my example would be to, in Central Asia, where white mulberry wood is really, really an important wood. And it, it actually is inter it's, it, it's important partly because it's part of the Silk Road. <laughs> and it's important because it's spread from China uh, into different parts of the world as a source of silk. And some of you know the reason why it's a source of silk is because it's the mulberry leaves that silkworms eat. And so they, they uh, carried sometimes um, quietly the, the, the plants um, along the Silk Road centuries ago and began to plant them in different parts in Uzbekistan, in Iran, and uh, in other areas. And over time, uh, these instruments, uh, pe people began to use the wood uh, for instru instruments and they discovered this incredible resonance uh, that they loved. Uh, another a wood that they loved as well, not only for, re not as much for resonance but for strength was apricot, also part of this travel um, over, over the Silk Road and, uh, and, and the travel of goods. Uh, but there's this companion relationship, there's a companion relationship in relation to the apricot and, and mulberry that are often put together in instruments, but it's also a companion relationship in, in terms of the recognizing how valuable this material, this tree is. Uh, to the culture, to the you know, development of silk, to the production of fruit, and, uh, and, and they hang on to this, and it is the sound. I mean, this is the sound uh, that they're looking for, the sound of mulberry uh, soundboards, 
uh, on their instruments. Wherever you go in, the, in those regions, they, they, they don't use spruce. Of course, they don't have easy access to spruce, but, they, but they, the sound that they covet uh, is, is um, the, the, um, <clears throat> the mulberry. A lot of my work, as I've already revealed, has to do with ecology, uh, environmental degradation, and economic impact of this degradation, the, um, including climate change and its influence on plant and, and animal life local economic systems and, and uh, resource access impacted by large-scale industry. <laughs> Those are all peepaws. <laughs> Lots of peepaws in China. Um, land degradation includes erosion that impacts forests and other lands due to human behaviors. That's, those are people stealing wood in Mongolia. And this all impacts lifestyles, including cultural lives and music. So I'm gonna, uh, I don't know how much time I have. I thought I was looking at the time and I realized I have like eight, 10 minutes, eight minutes, okay. I think I can do this. Uh, I, I wanna just tell you, I'm gonna jump away actually uh, for a minute from uh, Central Asia and talk about a, another project that I worked on because it's just, it's so interesting and this has to do with, with Australia actually, but it actually has to do with Africa. Um, because I was working on a project in Australia uh, um, uh, looking at field notes of someone who had done research very prominent ethnomusicologist who had done uh, research in Southern Africa uh, for uh, during the 1950s and 60s. And uh, he was uh, documenting the music and musical instruments of, a, of a, the Venda people. And one of the things that he was, he was interested in uh, was musical instruments. And he was documenting instruments such as this, uh, this um, marimba-like instrument, let's call it, uh, that, that was called mbila. And um, it's actually called Mbila Mutondo. And the Mutondo is actually the wood that is used for the bars. I guess I have, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> it's also used, uh, Mutondo is also used for an instrument, and I'm afraid you can't see this very well, and I guess I just don't, I, I don't think this cursor works. So if you can see that this, this is a young boy actually playing a little instrument with his thumbs and finger. Um, and, and so uh, it, the, that instrument is made of this mutondo wood. And part of his documentation uh, in this archive um, it notes, okay, this made of mutondo wood. But during the research and other notes, he, um, he said this wood was hard to find. Remember, this is 1950s and 1960s. But, and so by the end of the century, the end of the 20th century, the, the wood has com had completely disappeared from the region, and so did these instruments. And so now, in the, new, in the 21st century, the loss is so complete that nobody even knows how to make these instruments. And so, it, it, you know, this tie to a wood <laughs> for a musical instrument can, can actually be, you know, really detrimental to the health of, of the instrument. Uh, when uh, something happens to the, the access of, of, of the wood. I work with makers in many regions, as I've said, and, and they're, they're people who have experienced all kinds of ruptures uh, in, uh, related to ecology, uh, and they've had to make decisions, uh, tough decisions sometimes, about how they're going to deal uh, with the, the climate change, for example. Um, the, the development of tree farms. Uh, I call them tree farms. Uh, so tree farms where you have wood that's grown nice and quickly uh, for people to use uh, for lumber and for you know, local production, no help whatsoever for resonance for uh, musical instruments. And, and uh, so trying to communicate the importance of, of needing to be able to have old growth, slowly grown wood with you know, beautiful, tight you know, fibers uh, in, in, in order to make good instruments is something that's, that's a hard message at this point in, in our lives. But um, I, I wanna talk for in my last five minutes about resilience and adaptation. Because what I do find, I work with vulnerable people. <laughs> I work with vulnerable um, artists who are um, really struggling. But one of the things that I always marvel at is, is the resilience of the people I work with. I mean, they're economically vulnerable, they're 
they're vulnerable on so many levels, but they're so resilient. And, but resilience is paired with adaptation. Uh, you have to adapt to, uh, to be resilient. And so this resi and, it, and it's paired with innovation. So they're, they're really, and it's, it's really fascinating to look at the innovative uh, practices. And not, so I'm just gonna run through a, a couple of them, or a few of them. Uh, in Tetsu Lake, uh, Mongolia, there's a man who makes these, uh, an old fashioned, he was making an old fashioned, what's called morunghur, or luhur, actually dragonhur. <laughs> Um, and uh, he, it's an instrument that would normally have a carved bowl. I, I wish I had a cursor or something, but anyway, there, oh, there it goes. So a carved bowl, uh, and, and that would be the normal way uh, to make this instrument. But there is no wood that's big enough uh, to, make, uh, to make the bowl. So what he did was he, it was he took these little pieces of wood, he found um, you know, old pieces of furniture. <laughs> And, and he just took little pieces, some of them only two centimeters wide. You can kind of see that. It's not the greatest pictures. And he just patched them all together in order to create the instrument because he wanted the hard wood or the hardish <laughs> wood and he, wanted, and he knew what he wanted and he had to find a way to do it. My good friend Marikat in, in uh, Mongolia, uh, had, had, he, he essentially took apart his house uh, because he was trying to find the oldest wood that he could in his beams uh, in order to make musical instruments. Uh, but he ultimately ran out <laughs> of, of all that wood. And, uh, and he was wandering through the bazaar uh, in, in this very, very rural area uh, one day, and he discovered some axes that had been made in, in uh, Russia, uh, made with walnut um, uh, handles. Very, very rare in Mongolia. This is a place with, with very, very poor um, forest uh, situation, and uh, and so he began to um, to buy these up, hoping people wouldn't notice that he was buying huge numbers of axes every time they came in, and he began to use them to make uh, these quite novel instruments for the area, and and I think it really kind of stimulated creativity for him, and and created he's created some quite uh, fascinating instruments. Um, and some of this having to do with the loss of, of access to wood, but instead they, he's found other ways. Um, and, and musicians sometimes uh, it are, you know, when you're building a musical instrument, you need to age the wood. You need to have dry wood. If you don't, the wood will split. And there is some time when you don't, if you're vulnerably econo vulnerable economically, uh, you need to be able to make instruments as quickly as you possibly can. And so one of the, the strategies that I find makers uh, uh, use is to put their, their woods next to uh, the wood stove and try to dry them as quickly as they possibly can. And they burned horribly. Um, but you know what? <laughs> they play. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I find them really kind of troubling. But they play. Uh, and they sound, and, and so this is what they need to do um, at this point. Uh, and, the, and the creativity, instead of being able to having access to the, to the, the, you know, the trunk of the tree, they, they really, they, ju you know, they just don't. They have more access to the, the branches, <laughs> the tree and the branches, where there are knots um, and gnarls. And, and so uh, in, uh, instrument makers, uh, will will take advantage of that. This is this is an example actually of just taking advantage of of the creative opportunities <laughs> that that, a, that an unusual piece of wood uh, can can provide. So uh, you know, as I've and this is the last thing I'll say, um, as I've worked with with these makers uh, over the years, I, I've thought to myself in the first place, or as I was working, I I, I thought to myself, this is really sad. <laughs> you know, this is a really sad thing that, that these, these here's this um, potential musical instrument that's having to be patched together in a way. Uh, but th the fact is that you find not only examples of this, this is in um, two different really, really distant locations um, in different countries uh, where they're patching the instruments. And I was in a museum in um, uh, eastern China, uh, and I found this <laughs> also, an instrument or a piece of a musical instrument 
which is quite old. And you can see that this is something that's been going on for a long time. And so I think it, it kind of, it's a good lesson for us to recognize that you know, these, these musical instrument makers, they're, you know, they're, they're living in a variety of different circumstances. This isn't a Gibson factory. Um, but they, they are making music and they're making instruments and making music uh, for their communities. And, and I personally think they're do, they continue uh, to do a wonderful, wonderful job through the whole process of, of adapting. And, and I, I think it's a great lesson for all of us. Thank you. Thank you.